Hello and welcome to another episode of the NBA Outlet presented by OTGBasketball.com. I'm your host, Nick Fay. With me as always, my guy, Corey Waldron. How are we doing, Corey? Really good, Nick. I feel like we just recorded a pod, but you know, I may be a little bit delirious. <laughs> We're a little fresh right now. Just recorded another pod. This pod, sadly, is going to all be about NBA injuries. You know, I wanted to separate it just because I felt like it's more of a sour, like, sad feeling when you listen to the pod like this and separate it from the trade one that's all about the fun. So before we get started, you know, hearts and prayers out to all the guys that have gotten hurt, even the guys we're not going to mention, you know, working all year, working your whole life, working the off season, putting in so many hours, sweat, you know, energy into it, and then to get injured and miss your season is just terrible. And it's not even like these injuries are, you know, we're talking about missing 10 games. We're talking about missing the remainder of the season. So we're going to start with Andre Roberson. Obviously, yesterday, uh, OKC faced Detroit. They picked up the W. Roberson slipped, went down with a ruptured patella tendon. Honestly, the same injury that happened to Jeremy Lin, this is a tough one to watch from a fan perspective because you see, you can see on their face when they get hurt that they know that they're done. They can feel it. They're just like, my knee is shot. And Roberson knew and you could see the sadness in his face and his teammates, and it's just like there wasn't anything they could do. What was your reaction to Roberson getting hurt? Well, you know, you, you see him cut baseline. You see him go to elevate, and immediately the elevation is, you know, what, uh, two feet off the ground and then down, and then he dragged himself off the floor with his leg bent still. Um, and then, of course, uh, the worst thing you, know, you ever see with any athlete, any sport, is when they have to bring out a cart. Yeah, you know when when you can't when you can't leave the court off you know under your own power, um you know it's it's scary it's obviously sad, and obviously the Thunder, you know for the up and down season they've had to this point they were finally starting to catch momentum. Uh, Roberson is, you can argue, is their defensive anchor to a degree. We know offensively he struggles, but he really on the defensive side of the ball is the heart and soul of that team. You know he can guard one through three. He plays physical defense. He gives any defender a extremely tough night when he's on him. And it kind of takes the pressure off, you know, Paul George when he's there to not have to be so defensively engaged. Um, and it, it sucks and because the, the Thunder were really starting to take off. And now, as the Thunder, who don't have a lot of move, you know, wiggle room, you got to try and find a way to replace your best defensive player. I think what you made, is the, made the most sense with is the fact that OKC was starting to hit their rhythm. You know, the fact that they were starting to get in that groove and then the luxury of having a Roberson and a Paul George, when you have to match up with teams like the Houston Rockets and the Golden State Warriors, that is such a huge advantage. Obviously, Roberson isn't a great shooter. Offensively, he's not known for much. But we mentioned on a pod before, and we've seen it in videos and clips online, but I've watching the Nets and OKC game the other day. He just does a, a great job getting in the way of other players, you know, setting a lot of screens that you don't see necessarily on the screen, a lot of back screens, getting shooters open, just being in the right place at the right time. He's always running the fast break, even though he misses layups. You can never really doubt his energy and focus. So it sucks for them. What do you think OKC does? You know, do you think OKC goes out and gets another replacement right away? I don't know. I mean, you got to go right away, right? We got 11 days left, so yeah. pretty much right away. Um, I do think they go out there and they get or, somebody. Or I option saw two, one thing, sorry to cut you off, Corey, or option two no would way. be to sit on the cuts. They would be able to sit on, you know, whoever's cut from their team and try to scoop up guys that way. So that'd be the other option if not trading. Right. The only issue with the cuts is, you know, I just don't know if you get a guy who's going to be able to replace him off a cut. Yep. Because, I mean, Greg Monroe obviously would be a nice guy to go after at a cut, but that doesn't really suffice the deficiency you lose of Roberson. Um, just now, in between our podcast, I went on Twitter just to check, and uh, James Hollis, one of the snotty dripping, yep. uh, he made he tweeted that Jonathan Simmons, he thinks, would be a perfect fit in OKC. And I was thinking about it, and I actually really like that as a thought. You know, Jonathan Simmons, as we know, he's not electrifying offensively, but – he might be a better offensive player than Roberson, and he's not as good of a defensive player, but he's a very good defender. And we know that Warriors, especially last year, you know, he plays tough teams with a lot of grit and intensity. Like he doesn't, he like he want, he brings his best when the talent is the best. And I think you know if they wanted to find somebody, that might be the best way to go. Simmons would be an interesting guy. It would be, it would just be, you know, does the Orlando want to give him up? He's on a good contract. And I think with OKC, he's been asked to do a lot in Orlando. Like he's played point guard at times. He's had, had to create for himself where, so where he, if he went to OKC, it'd be a lot of, you know, 
fourth option, fifth option type stuff, just focus defensively, run the break. I think that would be a great fit. i just wondering what Orlando would do. Some other names you mentioned before on the other pod, Courtney Lee would be a name to think about. Marco Bellinelli would be another name. He doesn't obviously bring defensive, but he's a fill-in at that two-guard spot, gives you three-point shooting. And some of these guys, you don't necessarily have to bring in a starter. You could always start maybe Terrence and Ferguson for a little bit or somebody else. Or uh, even even somebody like a Damari Carroll, where you slide uh, Paul George back to the two, put Carroll at the three. I think they have the option to get a two or a three in the situation. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You don't have to necessarily go with a three because Paul George obviously can play the two or the three. Um, the, the one issue I have with this is obviously, and you, you know, this as well, the, the cap issue with yep. the Thunder is going to be the only issue because, you know, who, who can you send for a guy like Courtney Lee? Uh, obviously, the Jonathan Simmons contract is a little bit more friendly because I think it's $10 million a year. Um, it's but less. still, you know, oh, is it less? That's even yeah. better. Uh, oh, right. It was three years, $27 million, right? Yeah. So he, he's on a pretty good deal. A lot of people were surprised he didn't get more money. Right. Uh, I mean, really, in reality, Terrence Ferguson, who has had some nice moments for the Thunder, chance for him to get some big time minutes if he can earn that spot. Um, but again, you know, that's a guy who he doesn't have an NBA body yet. Yeah, you don't want to play him big playoff minutes. He, he'd yeah, be okay yeah. for the regular season to get you by, but I think you need a veteran, especially when you're with just the offensive firepower they have in the West. It's so tough not to add another veteran right now. Yeah, and I fear I, I fear that they would do like a two guard lineup with Felton starting. Yeah, exactly. just having Felton play big minutes too is scary. Uh, you could do something, I guess. You could put uh, the three and have Paul George play the two in that scenario, which isn't the worst case scenario because Jeremy Grant does play solid defense and does have the athletic uh, ability to run the floor. But uh, you know, OKC has some big questions to answer now in the, the next eleven days. Yeah, and they got to do it fast. Like you said, 11 days, there's not a ton of time to make a move. And it's not like they have a ton of assets and contracts that they can move around in place. So definitely want to see what OKC could do because they were just starting to get us excited. You know, they were just starting to be like, oh, wow, maybe this team can compete with uh, Houston and Golden State. Maybe they could give somebody a series. Now we'll never really know because Roberson, even though the numbers won't say so, he just had such a big impact on that team. Now moving on to another guy who's been banged up. And, like, we thought he would come back. We're kind of unsure, but that's Mike Conley. They just announced he'll have uh, surgery on his heel. He'll be out the remainder of the season. Now, this isn't as much impact on the court. No offense to the Grizzlies. They're not really in a playoff position. Conley's been out for quite some time. But this is more of an impact on the trade market in terms of what the Grizzlies are going to do now. Yeah. Um, I wonder how Muhammad feels, <laughs> our, our, our Grizzlies fan out there. Um, and I also want to say that me and Nick – uh, not that this is a, this is kind of a somber moment, but me and Nick said that the one issue for the Grizzlies would be health all year on the preview series, and uh, sadly that has been the issue. Uh, the yeah. Conley injury happened early, and honestly, the it, it, not career ending, uh, season ending, him having surgery. You know, there wasn't much talk the last couple of months about him missing the entire season. You know, they they really kept this you know under wraps. I, the last time I heard, he was doing shoot around drills, and he was on his way back. And then we get the report now that he's out for the season. So, you know, it came, it kind of came out of left field. Probably just being precautious. Like you mentioned, Nick, they're not playing for anything this year. You know, at best, they were going to be an eight seed if they even made a run, but it just wasn't likely. And now, you know, if you're the Grizzlies, you're, you're pretty much stuck that do you want to stay with an old core or do you want to sell it? And I, I'm, as we mentioned on the previous pod, I think you got to sell it. You just got to start getting rid of guys who are older. If you had to give me a percentage, give me a percentage on the probability Marcus Gasol and Tyreek Evans separately are traded. Uh, Tyreek Evans, probably, I'm going to say 85%. And then Marcus Gasol, I'll give 70%. I like it. I think I would go probably 85 to 90 for Tyreek because if you don't trade him, you're just wasting the fact that you have that expiring contract and that you're probably not going to sign him because you need to enter full rebuild. And then uh, Gasol, I think, is, is a little bit tougher. I think 65, 70 because of the fact that moving his contract isn't going to be easy because the Grizzlies are still going to want value for him, but he doesn't have that same value on the court that he once did. And like you mentioned before on previous pods, he's starting to get up there in age and the way the NBA is going, you need a quicker five. And he just doesn't seem to be capable of doing that possibly in the future. So uh, that's an interesting thing for the Grizzlies. Cause if they don't trade him now, I'm not sure that somebody's going to want to take on his, uh, 
$24 million deal. Obviously, last, last year of his contract in 2019, 2020 is a player option, which he'll probably buy into, especially at the rate his career is going. So you have to lock in Marcus Gasol if you trade for him for two more years at 24 to 25 mil a year. Yeah, and and also with that, you know, I don't know how much value they they would expect from Marcus Gasol because, like you said, the there's not a giant market out there for you know 32 and up centers that are make 20, you know, four million a year. I, I can, there's not very many teams I can think of that are going to want to give away you know assets for a guy like that who will be even contending. You know, there's only like a handful of teams that are going to be interested in Marcus Gasol. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. That's definitely something to keep an eye on. And that could be an issue for them where they might just have to sit on the contract. Um, another guy that I would maybe consider is Jermichael Green. He's not super young. I think people just think that he's younger than he is because he played some time in the G League. I think he's more of the mid-20s. He's on $8 million per year, $7 million next year. I think he could be a guy that would be a nice addition to a playoff team, a nice role player to have around. Yeah, I agree. He doesn't really get the the run that he he needs. I think in Memphis at times he kind of some some games he plays thirty minutes, other games he plays like fifteen minutes. Yeah, um, it's all for whatever over reason. Yeah, it, he he doesn't get the uh, a consistent amount of playing time as he did. In year, I mean, last year he did. Yeah, last year he was this starting, year, though, playing a lot of minutes, all and you know doing good things. And then in the off season, it looked like he was going to get some more money, but he didn't really get any good offer. So maybe there's something we don't know about Green that other people do. Moving on to the Marcus Cousins injury, we're going to bring on special guest Preston Ellis. He's the host of uh, the Bird Calls podcast, part of the OTG Podcast Network. He does a great job over there, so check that out. But sadly, we're going to bring him on to talk about the Demarcus Cousins injury, who went down on a Friday night with a ruptured Achilles tendon. Terrible news around the league. Uh, we wanted to bring Preston on to give us some coverage from New Orleans and you know with the feel of that whole fan base and everything over there. So Preston, what was your reaction when Demarcus Cousins went down? Man, it's it's difficult to describe because obviously this is this is difficult for everybody in the National Basketball Association. Like we we saw the outpouring of love with the injuries to Paul George, Gordon Hayward, and and we saw very similar outpouring for Demarcus Cousins for something as simple as an Achilles tear, which is it's it's not simple. It's obviously serious and it's career altering. We've seen it happen to Wesley Matthews and Rudy Gay, and those guys are playing well. But you could argue that they're you know they're not their their former selves. Wesley Matthews was on the verge of getting a max level contract. Rudy Gay, uh, obviously a bit past his prime and got back a lot quicker. And that's the upside for DeMarcus Cousins. But I was just talking to you guys off the air that the thing that is so crippling about DeMarcus is not the injury in itself. That's that's just the tip of the iceberg. What it really boils down to is, is DeMarcus as a person, the attacks on his character that have been levied over, over, the, over the life of his career. He's been called a cancer, a coach killer. This year, just two weeks ago, Justin Verrier of The Ringer not only questioned him starting in the All-Star game, questioned whether or not he had the validity to even be in it. And Pelicans fans nodded in agreement because he is just a head-scratching player, a guy who, you know, complains with calls. He gets the technical fouls. He doesn't run back on defense. Well, the last three weeks, guys, he was doing all of it. He was putting up 25, 13, and 5. Any guy who's ever averaged that over a season, over the course of a season, it's happened four times. Every single one of them took home a Most Valuable Player award. The team was winning eight out of nine games, but but more than that, you 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 hurt for this guy and you hurt for the franchise because he just lost out on the designated player extension last year when Sacramento traded him. That would have made him eligible for the Russell Westbrook deal, the five years, $207 million deal, which uh, Steph Curry got as well. But he was still eligible this summer with the New Orleans Pelicans for the five-year $176 million deal that Blake Griffin just signed. And every prognosticator, I, I don't care that the, the guys with the Celtics and the guys, the Cavaliers who are always rumoring trades, this guy's interested. It's, it's all BS. The fact is DeMarcus Cousins was coming back. And if he wasn't coming back for that five years, he was coming back for a two plus one just so that he could get back on the market for the super max, which is that $207 million deal at your, at your 10 year uh, veteran. Uh, I don't know, standing at once you get to the 10 year threshold, you guys know what I'm saying. Yep. But to see that happen. Now you send the franchise into a tailspin. Now Dell Demps and Alvin Gentry, if their leash wasn't short, boy, they're not going to make it through this offseason, barring a miracle, barring the, the Pelicans have no depth. Drew Holiday, DeMarcus Cousins, and Anthony Davis are top 10 in minutes played. And people are going to say to you, you're going to see this on Twitter, that Anthony Davis plays better with, DeMar with DeMarcus Cousins off the floor. That may be true, but guess who's behind Anthony Davis now? Omar Ashik. 
and Yikes. some combination of Dante Cunningham. Uh, hopefully Solomon Hill can be back in a month, but he has never played any minutes consistently at the four position. He's going to be forced to coming back from that torn hamstring. And, and more so than that, you just have to think about DeMarcus and his family. He went from five years, $176 million deal, rumors of LeBron being interested in the New Orleans Pelicans, rumors of him picking DeMarcus first because he wanted to, the opportunity to experiment playing with he and Anthony Davis. And now, who's to say what this guy's going to get offered? You, you have to think that the Pelicans have no other choice to bring him back, but what is he going to get? A one-year experimental uh, max offer, maybe a one plus one with the second being a team option? Like, he just went from being an MVP level candidate to possibly not getting a payday at all. And people, some people, and they've been thrown off of Twitter at this point, are, are saying our own uh, Fletcher Mackle of WDSU said, you know what, guys, you're going to hate me, but it's time to ask the question, should we trade DeMarcus Cousins before the deadline? And obviously all you would get in exchange is cap relief. And that's what people are talking about now. One of the best five players in the NBA this season, getting rid of for cap relief. But, but more so than that, and I'm, I'm monologuing, so I'll wrap this up just for the city. It's really tough for the city. We almost lost the Hornets uh, to Oklahoma City following Katrina and Chris Paul and David Stern fought hard to bring them back. But we've got a 92-year-old owner who's in a custody battle over the, the New Orleans Pelicans and the New Orleans Saints with his grandchildren who are fighting tooth and nail to get it from him. They want to move the team. Uh, Rita, his his third wife, you know, she's a very sweet woman, but but she has no interest in New Orleans. She's She's lived here for the better part of 30 years. But you know, somebody from Seattle says they want to give her $3 billion to, to take the, I mean, who's who's to say what could happen? And the city was just on the cusp. Like this couldn't have been a bigger stage, you guys. On ESPN, the second best team in the NBA. You've got Ryan Anderson, Eric Gordon, Trevor Ariza, Chris Paul, all these former Hornets coming back to town. That in itself draws attention. And you see DeMarcus Cousins tear his Achilles, not on any run of mill of the play, uh, run of mill play, the last possession of the game, fighting off his missed free throw. What if he makes that free throw? What happens differently in that four second window if he just manages to hit that second free throw? The game is essentially over. It's just fouls at that point. But instead, he gives full effort, fights for the ball, and and that's how it happens. And it's 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 hard to express how devastating it is. I'm I'm not smart enough to be able to to do it justice. Kevin Pelton has a great article. A lot of guys in New Orleans. Kevin O'Connor has a great stuff. I encourage everybody to check that out. But I'll, I'll wrap this up, guys. It's just it's just in a in a word devastating. Top five worst moments in New Orleans sports uh, history. Yeah, I said, President, before you got in here, you know. For the injury to happen, it was on a hustle play. You know, the thing that people say because it doesn't do at times or whatnot. You know, like you said, he was chasing down a missed free throw. You know, he was giving 110 percent, and um, you know, I know it was. I read a tweet about this too that you know this past month he's logged more minutes than he ever has his entire career. You know, who knows if that played a part into it? I mean, it probably played some kind of part into it. And like you said, the now there's all this uncertainty. You know, does do they want to resign him for the max? Do they do they still take a chance to resign him? Does he come back like he was from this injury to be the same player that he was this year? You know, do free agents want to come down and play with the Marcus Cousins, Anthony Davis now, not knowing what to expect? Like you said, it, it brings the entire city into a certain state of uncertainty of what will be or what could have been. Yeah, Preston did a great job. And the impact this injury not only had on the Pelicans, their future, but overall New Orleans and their location is, you know, very important to what's going to happen. I think uh, the Cousins injury, too, you made a great point, Preston, is how is he going to come back from the Achilles injury? We've seen guys come back healthy. And luckily, you know, Cousins isn't that super athlete. He's not a guy who's getting over the rim, throwing down crazy dunks. He's doing a lot of stuff underneath with his size. What do you think is what's going to happen when he comes back? How long is it going to take Cousins to get to an all-star type level when he returns from this injury? Well, this is the difficult part. Is we, we've seen firsthand that Wesley Matthews and, and Rudy Gay being a freak of nature. He's a He's been an efficient player this year. But we've seen Kobe Bryant, all three of these guys, and, and any guy of his size who suffers this injury, they don't come back. And if they do come back, it's a year and a half to two years minimum before they're close to 100%. You know, guys don't get injured like this and come back bigger and better and stronger and faster. The good news is, like you guys said, DeMarcus Cousins can't jump over a phone book, but he does, <laughs> he does use his agility to, to drive uh, at the top of the key. He likes to take those big men off the dribble. He's got that spin move that he utilizes, and it, it helps get uh, 
you know, shooters open on the wing and it helps him get to the cup. And it, it is something that he utilizes and he's definitely going to lose that aspect of his game. But other than that, you know, he's not an incredibly athletic guy. He doesn't really run the floor at, a, at an aggressive pace. You know, he kind of slowly trots up, but you know, it, it does, it does diminish from, from what he has. And, and what's even a bigger point of is the timing. At the trade deadline, it's it's too late for the Pelicans to qualify for the disabled player exception, which would have given us $18 million to to offer to a buyout player like Greg Monroe or to Andrew Bogut. We could have offered these guys more than anybody else across the association, but we're just two weeks late. Not only that, the rehab at, at best is going to bring him back to the practice floor. Uh, I want to say November, December. And at that point, free agency is done. It's too late. It's too late to bring in any of these guys, like you mentioned, guys that might potentially want to want to play with New Orleans for a discount once they see how well the team has done. That option is now off the table. So that removes Del, Del Demps and Alvin Gentry, who at this point, everybody's throwing around all these trade ideas. We're doing it in New Orleans. How are we going to get them help? They can't, that's, that's hilarious. That sounds like a little guy. I have an Eric, American Eskimo behind me myself. Um, yeah, but Sorry about uh, that. No, no worries. The, the troubling thing is, at this point, the Pelicans need help. They need depth, but you can't let Del Demps go and get it for them. You can't let him offload salary because by offloading bad salary like Alexis Agents and Omar Ashik, you're going to have to sacrifice first round picks. And we don't have a first round pick dating back to 2012, that just being Anthony Davis. Other than him, we don't have a first round pick on the roster. We've got two second round picks who we're hoping become NBA players. Um, Frank Jackson just uh, re-aggravated his broken foot. It was a stress fracture, and he rebroke it. And Shek Diallo has been a disaster defensively. He has a lot of upside and potential. He's only been playing uh, basketball for about five years. Uh, so, you know, you hope those guys can be rotation-level players. But New Orleans is is screwed. They 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 can't they can't offload these guys. They can't send out picks. They are who they are right now, and everybody's saying that they could still manage to get to the eighth seed because they are about four games up on the Clippers, something around there. And, and you know, there is the likelihood with Drew Holiday and Anthony Davis playing well that maybe they get enough wins. They need to finish somewhere around like 14 and 20 to finish with a 500 record. But what does that get you? That gets you an eighth seeded finish, and that gets you a 4-0 sweep against the Golden State Warriors, which we've already experienced in 2014 and 15. And that's not enough to pique interest in New Orleans at this point. We're tired of that. We want to get to the second round. We want to win a couple of first rounds games we want to we want to stir some momentum going into the next season especially with only two years remaining on Anthony Davis's contract it's it's time to make a push and it just couldn't come at at, at, a, at a worse time and should Dell Demps be able to bring in talent like a, a Jonathan Simmons or something with a first round pick or Damari Carroll or something a lot of people are going to be really upset because he doesn't deserve that benefit of the doubt at this point you can you can blame the injuries uh three years ago we had 352 games missed to to injury. That's an all-time NBA record. This year, of course, you're losing Boogie Cousin. Last year, we lost Drew Holiday for the first 12 games of the season. We started out 0-8. So you can you can make a lot of excuses, but after eight years, it doesn't matter what the problem is. It's, it's time to, to change things up. And man... The positive thing is, the positive thing is, Demarcus Cousins is probably going to be a Pelican going back. This this further solidifies this. It's very unlikely that you know the Phoenix Suns or the Dallas Mavericks come in with a three year, ninety million dollar contract. So that that is the silver lining to this. Even if he's not the player that he was, you have to believe that he's still a top ten level center and somebody who has great chemistry with Anthony Davis. If you guys got a chance to watch the Houston Rockets game, it was beautiful. Their chemistry, their pick and pop, their pick and roll. Uh, I think Anthony Davis had like five alley-oops in the first quarter, and the majority of them were thrown from the Marcus Cousins. So it was beautiful to watch. And and like I said, hopefully he can bring some of that back next year. Yeah, I mean – Oh, go ahead, Corey. I was going to say, you know, I watched that Chicago Bulls game a few nights ago when they came back and they won a double OT, you know, there, you can you can make an argument that if they had the right pieces around them, that Anthony Davis and Marcus Cousins and the Pelicans, you know, they could be one of the best teams, if not the best team in the league, because there is just no way to guard Cousins and Davis when they are both healthy and on the floor. And like you said, you know, they're, the, ish, the injuries in the past, and you haven't been able to bring in a lot of guys in the past that kind of like build around Davis and now, you know, Cousins and all that. But the team has always been, you know, just right there. And now it's not a state – now you're at a point where, you know, it's what could have been. Yeah, I know you think, you know, Gentry will be fired and um, the GM will probably be fired too. But, you know, the Pelicans issue is constantly, it's a what could have been scenario. It's not like, you know, this is where we are. It's, you know, we just, we came up short. It's always been like a what could have been. Yeah, definitely. And just, just to put a lighter spin on things, um, now, now teams around the NBA are on watch. Uh, players around the NBA are on watch. 
The, the Pelicans won eight of nine. And like you said, they're unguardable. Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins, especially with the way the Drew Holiday, he's having the best year of his career, both defensively and offensively. But what really makes these guys special is the way that they were playing defense the past three weeks. They were shutting teams down. You mentioned the Chicago Bulls. We spotted them an 18 minute or uh, 18 point lead, excuse me, with 7.30 left in the game, 7.33 specifically. And Anthony Davis was quoted after the game and he said, we just decided to play defense. We just talked in the huddle and we said, we're going to play defense from this point out. Think about that. They were not playing hard up until that point. Now that in itself is very frustrating. You're like, you, these guys should be playing hard 48 minutes. And then you just take into account that they're all averaging close to 40 minutes a game. They're probably pretty tired. They're probably trying to save themselves for, for a fourth quarter push. But 18 down, they shut the Bulls down. I can't remember exactly what the, what the run was. They finished on something like a 21 to three run just obliterated the Chicago Bulls. Obviously, you're like, they're the Bulls. They're not even in the playoff picture right now. The Bulls at this point had been on like a 17-8 and eight run, I want to say, with Nikola Miritich back in the lineup. They were playing beautiful basketball. They were shooting well. They were great defensively. And the Pelicans just shut them down. They just said, you're not scoring again for the final seven and a half minutes. And it all started with Drew Holiday, Anthony Davis, and DeMarcus Cousins. DeMarcus, for all the grief we've given him, like I said, the past three weeks, He's been an all NBA uh, defensive type player. It, it's and players know that now and coaches know that now there's a lot of respect for him around the league. And though he won't come back at 100 percent, they know how good he is when he is healthy. And maybe just the promise of that possibility could be enough to, to stir up some interest in New Orleans this offseason. Yeah, and I think you hit a great point as well. The fact that the Pelicans were doing so well, and they had just beaten a Boston Celtics team not that long ago, and the Houston Rockets team right there, you know, getting wins over two of the top five teams in the league, and then picking up the defense, seeing the effort paying off, I think the Pelicans were really set on a nice stretch moving forward, but obviously the injury really hurts that. What do you think, we talked about this actually on one of our previous pods, what do you think about a trade for the Pelicans where they pick up Dwayne Dedman from Atlanta for Alexis Ajinka, uh, Czech Diallo, and a second round pick? I just don't think the Hawks do it. Um, obviously, Dwayne Dedman is a player that the Pelicans desperately need, um, and he's a perfect fit. He's not being utilized there. Nerlens Noel is another possibility. Jonathan Simmons is somebody that that rings some ears in Orlando. If you have some combination of like Alfred uh, Payton and Jonathan Simmons for Omar Ashik and a first round pick, but that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a first round pick. Nobody wants another year of Alexis Agenset at five million. He's dead salary. It's going to take more than a second. We've seen. How, how close to the best uh, NBA general managers are keeping uh, their, their salary going forward at this point in time. And even somebody at $5.3 million, which is what Alexis Agenza has promised in 2018-19 season, it's, it's just too much. It's too much. And the Pelicans don't have the asset, like a Czech Diallo you mentioned, but he's been unplayable defensively. He's a guy who picked up three fouls and a three-second violation in his first minute on the NBA wow. court this year. He's beautiful offensively. He dominates summer league, but but you put him against the big boys and he just can't stay on the floor. But he does have a beautiful jumper, a great inside game. Offensively, he's, he's definitely going to be a contributor in this league if he can figure out his defensive awareness, but he just hasn't yet. And so you have to think that he's a minus at this point, or at least even Frank Jackson, same thing. But the only player who's movable at this point in time is really Etuan Moore, but the Pelicans need him. He's he's part of their crunch time uh, lineup. He's the best shooter in the NBA. If he's not right now, he was three weeks ago. He's somewhat, he's around 45% from three-point range and has been all season long. He was 57% in December. He was unconscious. He's been a little bit slower this month, so his numbers have dipped. But he's great defensively. They've been asking him to play the three. He's the only contract they can move and actually get something in return from. Like they could do a Jonathan Simmons, Etuan Moore swap you'd have to believe because he's such a valuable defender and shooter. Um, but yeah, in, in order to move a Jensa, it's going to take a first round pick. And there's a lot of guys pulling right now for some combination of Marco Bellinelli and Dwayne Dedman for, I don't know, probably Ashik and a first round pick. If we do send a first round pick, it's got to be for Ashik. A Jensa, his contract is too small. It's not worth it. We can just stretch him in the off season or wait until the trade deadline next year when that 5 million expiring might be a bit more valuable. It's, it's just the price is a bit too high, especially with Boogie out. If the Pelicans do manage to fall out of the playoffs, that could potentially be a, a 14th overall pick, 15th overall pick somewhere in that area. So it's it's just too valuable to to try to what? I don't know, win two games in the first round, maybe get an eighth seeded finish. It's it's just you gotta hang on to that pick. If nothing else, you you wait until the summer and maybe you can get something a bit more valuable then when teams are ready to offload uh, some some better contributors or somebody on a longer term deal. I have to ask you this. What are your, uh, obviously everybody in the NBA world wants to know. I have my thoughts and Corey has his. 
uh, is the probability change that, you know, the Pelicans trade Anthony Davis or does this, you know, confirm that they're going to keep him now for sure? The or... Pelicans. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I want to Pel- hear your thoughts on this. The Pelicans will never trade Anthony Davis unless he requests to be traded. That 100% agree. 100%. Uh, that it's not going to happen. He is the franchise. It would be crippling. Uh, the, this this city can't go through another rebuild. We're seeing it in Orlando right now. They've been five years out of the playoffs, and they're starting over again. And you can just hear it in the voices of the media guys, of John Hammond, of Jeff Weltman, of Frank Vogel, everybody involved with that franchise. It's it's just too much for a city that doesn't really care about basketball. And Orlando does because they've got the you know Orlando soccer team. Other than that, the city is is about the Orlando Magic. And New Orleans, they don't have that advantage. People love the LSU Tigers. They love the New Orleans Saints. Everybody has a New Orleans Saint flag out front. So the Pelicans cannot afford that. And there's not a big enough return in the NBA to keep the Pelicans as a contender at one at this point. Everybody's going to say, you know, some version of Jason Tatum. And and we're all sick and tired of hearing the Jason Tatum <laughs> for Anthony Davis comparisons. Um, and I'm not going to go into it because I doesn't. I don't think it, it deserves a minute of our time. But there's there's just not there's there's not the trade partner out there. If if anything, it would it would have to be two like all star level players because that's how well the Pelicans revere Anthony Davis. C.J. McCollum in a first round pick is not going to be enough. C.J. McCollum in a top five pick would not be enough. The Pelicans think Anthony Davis is the best player in the association, given the right circumstance, given 100% locked in. Um, obviously, you've got Kevin Durant and LeBron James, but with with those guys out of the picture, there is not a single player in the NBA that the Pelicans would trade Anthony Davis for, unless, like I said, he has to be traded. So he's he's going to finish out his contract here, and things could change this offseason when they bring in a new general manager, maybe – Maybe a uh, 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 Sam Hinkie has a has a different direction in mind, uh, but right now the rumored people are uh, Danny Ferry, of course, the former general manager of the Atlanta Hawks, has been a close advisor to Del Demps and uh, Joe Dumars, which I think would be a disaster. But but those are the names right now, um, and obviously Del Demps has until the off season to to try to keep these guys going, try to keep them afloat. And right now their best possible hope is buyout candidates. And those have to be some version of Andrew Bogut, maybe Greg Monroe, maybe Vince Carter. They're going to have to hope that somebody asks to come to New Orleans, that somebody sees Anthony Davis, sees that open center position and says, I want to play with that guy. And right now it's it's Andrew Bogut's our best bet. If we could get Greg Monroe, that would be that that could potentially be a, be a season changer. And by season changer, I don't mean we're going all the way. I mean, you know, possibly stay around the fifth seed and or the sixth seed and get a chance at San Antonio and Minnesota. And that is that that would just change everything going forward. That would be a scenario where maybe Dell Demps and Alvin Gentry buy another year. Maybe uh Boogie Cousins gets a one plus one and they try to sign Greg Monroe. But man, to just to get negative again, the Pelicans have no flexibility going forward financially. So they don't even have the resources to bring back a Greg Monroe, even if he came back on a team friendly deal. Um Things are things are just tough in New Orleans right now, and this couldn't have come at a worse time. But with that being said, like we saw what they could be, and and that that promise, that glimmer of hope, is is something that you can hold on to going forward when Demarcus Cousins comes back, whether it be in January, February, March, is that we know what the team can be, and that's a, a contending level team. Agreed. I think that you've seen enough of that team where you know. And then the one thing I think that you could have in your back pocket, obviously we could all agree that Cousins probably is never going to hit the level that we've seen him at. But Anthony Davis is going to continue to get better, and there's plenty of more levels for him to hit. And you could probably argue Drew Holiday probably could hit another level as well, especially having a good year that he's having right now. So there are some pluses if Cousins can come back at some point and get to 80% of what he was. Definitely. And and you couldn't be more right about Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday over the life of his career. Oh, that's my dog now. We're taking turns. <laughs> uh, uh, Drew Holiday over the life of his career has has been better with one uh, big on the floor and that big being, you know, either Anthony Davis or DeMarcus Cousins. But you, t- you put two on the floor and it takes away some of his spacing. But he figured that out this year. And this year he's shooting better from two-point range than he has in his entire career, shooting above 57%. Obviously, his three-point range is only at about 34 right now, I want to say. But there, there is another level with more spacing, with more opportunity for him to be aggressive, which is when he excels. When he's timid and he looks indecisive, that's when he gets the, the, the five turnover games. 
uh, and his shooting suffers and he's forcing passes that he doesn't need to force. So you're absolutely right. But the Pelicans are in trouble here because they have no depth and they're going to have to insert either Dante Cunningham, who's been a disaster this season, or, or Omar Ashik, who some could argue doesn't even belong on an NBA roster anymore yeah. at this point in his career. So the, the choices really um, aren't very attractive at this point for who's going to take Boogie's minutes but but we're going to get a glimpse i think in about an hour and two minutes right now of who this pelicans team is going to be going forward when they match up with the los angeles clippers and it's probably another nationally televised game so there's going to be a lot of eyes on it and um boogie's been in good spirits he did his uh comedy jam that he's been uh, advertising for about three months he's been with the team watching film uh he should go into surgery at this point this week but having him around having that positive energy might be enough to to if the pelicans can come out and have a decisive victory. They've got a, a tough schedule in the next five to six games before they get to the trade deadline. If they can make some waves here, they they might get a couple of guys, a couple of Vince Carters and Greg Monroe to say, you know what? I like what that team's doing. They need minutes. I'm going to give it to them. And maybe it gets me one, one more great contract before I, I retire. I would love to see Greg Monroe uh, in New Orleans. Obviously, like you mentioned, with the cap issue, him staying past this season could be, in, you know, possibly new, not – not a you know not a real possibility but i would like to see him down there and like you mentioned though you know he's going to be the real problem with them is who can you really bring in hopefully a buyout of you know Vince Carter or Andrew Bogut can get down there um but like you mentioned with DeMarcus Cousins being around the team i i know i saw a tweet about him being around and watching film with the guys i think that also proves your point that he is going to stick around with the Pelicans like he doesn't want to go anywhere you know he he's not pushing away from the team he's not secluding himself He's still being there with the guys. It's one thing as well that you can look forward to as a Pelicans fan is that he doesn't, you know, seem to already be out the door. If yeah. I could add, if I could add one more thing before I let you guys in, uh, Nerlens Noel and Scal Labissier, some guys who are are recently on the on the block. Nerlens Noel's not being utilized in Dallas. He, I, I think it's almost they're just holding him out of scorn at this point. Um, if they would be willing to, I mean, they would have to take back salary, but. Um, uh, it, it would have to be two expirings like a like a Dante Cunningham and a, and a Jameer Nelson or something in exchange for New Orleans Noel and a second round pick. That could be an avenue where a second round pick could get a real difference maker. But that's that's the only one I really see. Yeah, I think a second round pick could get it done for Noel. Like you said, obviously Dallas is not going to keep him. That's been a terrible situation where he's shown a lot of potential when he was on the floor, but behind the scenes, it's not working out. Going to give a big shout out to Preston. Thank you for hopping on. Obviously, best wishes to DeMarcus Cousins, New Orleans Pelicans, and all the injured players we talked about on this pod. Corey, thank you for hopping on, and thanks to all the listeners for listening in. You guys are awesome. Thanks.